A very interesting documentary has been uh, nominated for an Asia Pacific Screen Award, uh, a documentary called Delicado. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the uh, director of Delicado, Carl Malakunas. Carl, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Hi, Peter. Uh, nice, nice, nice to talk to you. Thanks for the opportunity. Good to talk to you. And this is such an intriguing documentary about the island of Palawan, which is uh, uh, part of the Philippines, and the uh, the uh, native inhabitants, the indigenous inhabitants fighting the um, uh, ruination, if you like, of their environment and of uh, of the island. How did it come about that you were able to make this film and uh, what inspired it? I'm a journalist by by trade uh, and uh, I work for a, a wire agency. It's called Agence France Press, AFP. Uh, I was based in Manila as the bureau chief for AFP um, about a decade ago. I was going to go down to Palawan and do a story on ecotourism. It was an excuse to go down and have a look at this incredibly beautiful place. It's the, it's the backdrop to Hollywood films, um, you know, one of one of Asia's hottest tourist destinations now. Um, and I was going to go down and and just uh, have a look at this beautiful place. And the environmental campaigner that I was in touch with and on the phone with, uh, he was going to take me to his uh, projects, was shot in the head and, and killed um, a few days before I was about to go down. And so I instead went to investigate his murder. Uh, I did a, a, a piece of journalism for AFP back in 2011 um, that essentially started with, you know, for for tourists, you know, Palawan is is like paradise for um, for the people of Palawan. It's more akin to a battlefield, and essentially that was the um, the start of the uh, the idea of the film, and uh, it just kept going from there. Wow. Well, let's go to the next step because uh, this is your debut film. Uh, how mm. how were you able to get um, production behind your financing to be able to make this film in the first place? So I spent quite a number of years just uh, just working away by myself uh, and uh, sort of you know, self financing. Uh, you know, when I, I went down to Palawan quite a number of times with uh, you, know, uh, you know by myself, and then with uh, just a, a with, with, with a, a freelance journalist that I could uh, scrape some money together to, uh, to to do some filming with me, and uh, we just kept doing that for for a while, um, and it, it just it just continued to build. I did a second piece of, of journalism. Uh, I took a few weeks uh, holiday from from AFP and went down there and uh, and just did a longer piece. So that was a four and a half minute video. It, it built into and uh, and uh, a longer text piece and photos and um, it, it just it just kept developing. I won a, a an Amnesty Human Rights Award for for that piece of journalism. Uh, the, um, the 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 content for AFP got widely used uh, around the world. Um, it started to, to to build its own sort of momentum, and from there, uh, I was very lucky to um, to um, to uh, to attract a sort of a, an old friend, um, a producer, um, Marty Sahuko, uh, who's from the Philippines, um, and he, he's my, he and uh, his. Um, uh, a film partner Michael Collins um, had made uh, made a brilliant documentary um, about a decade ago on the Philippines called Give Up Tomorrow. Um, it was, it was a absolutely um, exposing sort of uh, the uh, sort of justice uh, a um, a man who was uh, uh, falsely sentenced to death. Um, it was an incredible documentary, and so I, I you know I'd been in touch with them over the years, and you know everything just started to come together. They, they, they got involved with the film, and from there we were able to, to to pick things up in terms of um, getting support. And they were they were um, they, they were crucial to organising all that. What a process! Well, congratulations on uh, on achieving that. Now let's let's talk about the filming process and the the various uh, activists who are who are fighting against the uh, the loggers and and uh, and others who are ruining the island. Um, w- was it easy for you to get access to them and for them to allow themselves to be filmed? I uh, well. Yes, in terms of there was never really any convincing. It was a long process. As I said, I, I first started this in, in 2011 and I went, I went again in 2012. Then it was a number of years went past and I'd stayed in touch with uh, Bobby Chan, who's the main uh, protagonist. Uh, and um, 
I think the key for the, the key for for Bobby was, you know, I, I I just kept going down and you know speaking to him, talking to him, and uh, I didn't know I was going to make a documentary. I was just, you know, in in my head, I was doing some journalism, and then I thought maybe I'll do, you know, do twenty minutes on YouTube, just make something myself and put it out there, and uh, so it was it was very organic in in in, in that respect, and. Uh, I remember the, you know, sort of. I guess one of the key moments was I was down there one time, and Bobby said, "Well, look, if you're really, if you're really interested in doing this, um, you better get out with the guys and um, you know, help and and film them confiscating some chainsaws." Uh, I said, "Okay, sure. When?" He said, "Well, now they're they're leaving. Um, get in, get in the van." <laughs> and so just jumped in the van with them, and uh, and and we drove through the night and slept on the side of the road, and found myself hiking in the in in the forest, and you know, in there and uh you know for uh for over a day and a day and a half and we you know, filmed two chainsaw confiscations um and came out and there was a really sort of visceral moment in there when tata the other um main um you know, uh, leader of the of the group um you know we, we filmed filmed this uh this confiscation that was sitting there on the in the forest and he just sort of you know there was just this huge emotional outburst and and you know it was is to say why are we doing this and and you know why is it our role and you know um why yeah why are we putting ourselves on the line to to do this and he sort of came out afterwards and he just said just having someone in there and 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 filming it just released some, something and then when i you know in him and when i came back to to uh, to Port of Princess of the capital, and you know, with Tartar and the boys and the chainsaw, and and Bobby had seen that there was this, you know, the the, the confiscation had been filmed. He there was a couple of things. One, he was it, it, again, it also just opened up something for him. He said, "We need to, we need to show this." Um, and the other thing was, he said, "Look, a lot of journalists have come down over the years, and no one's ever gone into the forest with my boys." Um, and from then on, we had this sort of special relationship. <laughs> How very interesting. Now, to be able to film immediately, um, that, that really intrigued me because did you, what sort of camera did you use? Was it a single camera? How did all that work? So back then, we'd, uh, I was with, with a, a freelance journalist that, that I mentioned, there was the two of us, and uh, we'd, uh, I'd borrowed one, uh, uh, a small camera, a HD camera from, from work, um, from AFP, and... Uh, and the and the freelancer had borrowed a camera from uh, from one of his friends, and uh, and we're in there, and um, it, the the conditions were so hot and humid and and rainy. One of the cameras just went with um, you know as we're getting you know we've been hiking for about a day, and one of the chainsaws died just as we could start hearing the chainsaws. So he had one, one, had one small camera and went in with that, and um, you know sort of early on in the film, it looks like it's archive footage. Um, that was actually that first uh, that first mission uh, when Bobby's sort of talking about the uh, you know the backstory and some of it looks really 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 grainy um, and uh, and not terribly well shot. Well, that 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 was me. <laughs> and, and then when we got when we got the funding, um, you know, the first thing we, we did was able to to bring in um, someone to lift the production values, and that was Tom Bannigan, uh, a cinematographer from Sydney, um, just an incredibly. Um, Beautiful cameraman and incredibly tough guy to to be in the forest with. Um, so Tom was, you know, when you see the the great production values, we can thank Tom for that. Oh, well done on that. that. That's again such an interesting process. Now, am I right in saying delicado is Filipino for danger or or dangerous? That's dangerous, yes, yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's you know, there's a couple of meanings, and uh, but dangerous is the is the most common interpretation of it, and. Uh, and the reason why the film is called that is, and I don't speak a lot of Tagalog. I was there for almost a decade, but uh, you know, it's not as if I, I, I speak it very, very well. But uh, you know, you, you, I'm in these conversations with Bobby in the, you know, with his parent forces uh, and and his staff in their headquarters. You know, and there's Tagalog, 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 Delicado, Tagalog, Delicado. They were in the forest with Tata with the boys, and and you know he's whispering, he's giving his hand signals, and and whispering, Delicado, Delicado. Uh, and then with Nieves, the um, the the, the mayor who was put on Duterte's drug list, um, you know, she's out on the out on the campaign trail, you know, essentially waiting to be, um, you know, waiting to potentially be be be, be shot, you know, with these extrajudicial killings and murdered. 
Um, and she's out there with her team and you hear, and, and you hear these whispers, Delicato. So it was just this word that just set, sort of came up organically, you know, throughout the film and, and just decided, you know, that sort of the, the title of the film just, just came through through that process. Uh, absolutely. I can see how it fits so well. But I was wondering, how much danger were you and some of the others really in? Because uh, it looked to me as if uh, you could have been shot or or hurt at any time. Um. Look, I mean, there's there's some elements of danger. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know the, the the guys do go in sort of unarmed and, and barefoot, and you know they 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 they're, they're challenging um, you know illegal loggers, you know mostly who are armed. Um, you know, they you know, Tom and and myself are sort of old journalists who've done sort of conflict reporting, and you know uh, you know in 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 various one ways or another. So. Um, yeah. But I mean, overall, the dangers that we're facing are, you know, are really so minute compared with what the, you know, Tata and the guys face, you know, every day. Uh, what Bobby faces in terms of, you know, potentially being, uh, and Nieves just being, you know, shot on, you know, in, on on the on the streets essentially, um, which is what happens to environmental campaigners down there. So we sort of took a lot of inspiration and 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 courage from them, and and you know we. Um, uh, and I guess the other element is, you know, with people like Tata in the forest, he's he's an ex-paramilitary um, leader. And when you're in the forest with him, the first time I, I mentioned that I went in there, I had you know, no idea. I didn't know Tata. I, did, I didn't know any of the guys. And I'm walking through the forest and there's this guy sort of giving these hand signals and whispering. And it's like, this guy's in control. This guy knows what he's doing. And you had this sort of sense of confidence. Um, so, um, so you know, definitely, you know, we've, we felt, you know, a lot safer, we, you know, because we were with Tartar and the guys. Um, and I guess maybe another the final part of that is we kept a very minimal um, uh, presence um, because, of, because of that. So, you know, essentially, once you know Tom came on, you know we there were you know we'd have a um, maybe one other person with us, um, you know fr from the from the Philippines, but we wanted to keep that uh, that team as small as possible um, for uh, a number of safety reasons. Wow, wow, how interesting! <laughs> now the politics of all this is uh, I found fascinating with the uh, elections, the local council, and so on elections that you filmed, and of course the the role of Duterte in uh, in the policies about um uh clearing the land and uh, and all that sort of thing um w was there a strong political influence in terms of the way you made the film or advice you received about what you could cover or what you couldn't cover uh as a as a journalist, you know, I was there throughout all the the Duterte years and the drug war. And as a you know, in my in my day job, I was out in the streets of Manila filming the you know the the you know the the in the slums, just bodies upon bodies, you know, on, on the streets at night. It was just mass murder, you know, especially in the, in those first couple of years, you know, when it was just so open and brazen. Um, you know, we, we we saw saw a lot of that. Um, I mean, I, I did a lot of reporting. I was down in Davao, Duterte's you know hometown, um, where he ruled as mayor for twenty years before becoming uh, president. You know, and 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 speaking to a woman who'd lost her four sons. You know, um, they'd all been murdered um, by the so-called you know, Davao death squads, the DDSs as they were called, or the Duterte death squads, um, and. Um, so that was just all a part of the conversation and the thinking, you know, at, at the time. Um, it wasn't a deliberate choice to go into um, the, the drug war uh, at all. Um, I, you know, I was filming the, the power enforcers. I was filming the, uh, the, the guys in, the, in, in, in confiscating chainsaws out of the, you know, out of the forest. And that's all it was at, at that point. And as I said, I was thinking of a 20 minute YouTube video. And then, um, you know, one of the power enforcers was murdered. And the um, in the forest, and you know, and we went to his wake, and there was this uh, incredibly powerful um, speech by uh, by a woman. I had no idea who she was, and she obviously had control of this uh, of this audience, and she was. Um, uh, it was in a sort of a basketball court um, uh, where the where the wake was uh, was being um, was being conducted. And uh, you know, there was a lot of emotion, tears, everyone was crying. And then at, at the funeral, uh, when at, at the actual burial, uh, this lady was um, guiding the, the operations and she was with the family bearing the coffin. 
said, who, who is this woman? And uh, and it was Nieves Rosento. And she was, you know, this longtime environmental campaigner, a friend of the murdered logger um, who had um, recently become mayor of El Nido, the, the hottest tourist town in, in, in the Philippines. And so when I started talking to her, she said, you know, um, they told me her backstory is an environmental campaigner. And she goes, I'm on, I'm on, I've been told I'm on Duterte's drug list. And I said, no, no, why? What happened? And uh, and you know, she'd been, you know, as you know, as mayor and environmental campaigner, she'd been, you know, taking on the developers, taking on the illegal loggers, taking on the powerful politicians in El Nido. Um, and for that, she'd been, uh, you know, she said that she'd been put on um, on the drug on the drug list. And um, you know, and I, I, again, just through my reporting and knowledge of the situation, I, I, I knew that. You know, when a politician gets put on the drug list, that could be game over. There are politicians who have just been shot dead afterwards, they, um, you know, extrajudicial killings. Uh, and that's what Nieves was facing. So I just started following that story. Um, and what I you know, sort of realised very, you know, very quickly that, you know, this was an opportunity to tell the drug war story in a in a different way. As as a, as a journalist, I've been you know, covering the you know all the you know the the um, the people in these poor communities who have just been who have just been um, uh, murdered, and the the general narrative I I felt was that most people in the Philippines and beyond felt that the drug war was a um, a misguided but genuine attempt to eradicate drugs in society um and it, it's it really wasn't that um it it, it was it was, the drug war was a um tool a weapon uh, used by Duterte and his allies um to control the levers of power um and and the economy and that's what I was seeing with 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 Nieves and it was taking place in this incredibly beautiful location of El Nido. So that's how it developed into this un unexpected sort of journey in into the drug war. Wow. And of course, with the, with the local elections, it's obviously developers and business have had candidates that won uh, the, the local elections that um, made sure that the environmentalists um, lost, I suppose. And that, that adds an another layer of politics onto that. Uh, it, it does. Uh, you know, it, 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 before my filming started and after it started, it's, it, it, these uh, these trends and forces are still in play. Um, you know, the the, the governor um, of the province, uh, he's uh, well, the then governor of the province, um, is a very powerful man. He was once the richest elected official in the Philippines um, on a regional or national level. Incredibly wealthy businessman made his money from logging in Palawan when logging was legal. He had the, the you know, the, he was the the timber concessions. He was now the you know, thirty years later the governor of the island. Uh, Nieves um, beat the governor's brother to become uh, mayor of, of El Nido um, before our filming started. Um, you know, so um, you know these forces um, that are you know the, of the developers and the politicians um, uh, are extremely um, powerful and and enduring. Yeah, uh, incredible, incredible story. So, with all of the footage that you shot, etc., tell me about the editing process because that's always the uh, the biggest uh, challenge, I suppose, uh, after the filming. That was incredibly challenging. Um, you know, we, um, you know, it was it was through the pandemic. Uh, it was uh, so, and I'm based here in Hong Kong. Uh, throughout the pandemic, really couldn't travel. We, you know, we had these three week quarantines, and um, uh, with my work and the young family, there was just no opportunity to be able to to leave Hong Kong. Um, we had uh, Michael Collins uh, was our, our our main editor, an American um, uh, filmmaker um, who was actually based in Australia for throughout most of the you know the pandemic, um, and then um, Eric uh, Daniel Metzger based in California. Um, so we had this editing process that was uh, between three different time zones across the world. Um, trying to manage the um, the, uh, the the editing um, without ever coming together, um, and you know, I guess if people say that you know editing can be done remotely, uh, I'd say yes, it can, but it's a it's a pretty tough uh, process. Um, so it took two years to, to to do the edit, um, 
Um, and you know, we always felt that if we could just get in the same room and uh, and and you know for for a few days, we'd probably you know shave a few months off the process. Um, but I was really really lucky that you know had uh, and Michael and Eric basically to to, to guide you know, through. You know, I'm a first time filmmaker. They're very experienced. You know, brilliant editors, and um, and they're really important. And and then sort of throughout, you know, towards you know um, you know. To, uh, uh, at one stage through the edit, we also were uh, very, very lucky to have Laura Nix come in um, as an executive producer and a, and a, and a, um, basically an edit, edit, editing consultant and a, and, a, and a writer. And she was um, she was brilliant in helping to you know to 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 to, to bring the story together as well. Well done on that. That's a, that's an incredible story. Um, I mean, it's great now that the film has been uh, shortlisted uh, for a prize at uh, the Asia Pacific Screen Awards for the uh, best documentary. And I noticed uh, uh, something about the Walkley Awards that um, uh, there might be some possibilities there. I'm also intrigued to know: Have the people of Palawan or the people you filmed seen your film? Um, the, um, the participants in the film, uh, have, um, we haven't screened the film in Palawan itself for safety and security reasons at this point. Um, we had our, uh, Philippine premiere at the Cinemalaya Film Festival, um, which is sort of the, 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 the main, the biggest film festival in the Philippines, uh, at the cultural center of, of the Philippines in, in Manila. Um, this was back in August. Um, the, 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 the venue seats 1,800 people were selected to close the, 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 the festival. And, you know, I you know, hope we get a few hundred people in here. Um, you know, I hope we can fill some of the seats. Um, with COVID restrictions, it was brought down to 1,500 people, uh, the capacity, and we got there and it was completely packed. Um, and it was completely full house. And um, you know, we're running an impact campaign um, you know, for, for the film to help you know, to, you know, you know, empower the land defenders of Palawan and beyond. And as part of that, uh, I, was, I, was, I was lucky enough to be able to, to, to fund and bring the uh, participants up from Palawan. So we had 20 of them come up from Palawan. Um, so, some of the parent forces had never been out of Palawan before. Um, and they, they came in and, you know, I can, I can share a YouTube clip with you, with you afterwards. It was, it was just incredible. The, um, the, the, re, the, 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 um, the roller coaster ride of emotion throughout the film, you know, was electric inside during that 90 minutes um, in, in, in the, um, at the CCP. And then afterwards, when the crowd realised that that Nieves and Bobby and Tata and the Parent Forces were there, and they stood up and they got on stage, uh, it, every, there was not a, a dry dry eye in the house. It was just incredible. It was uh, and it made everything made everything worth it. So they loved it, um, and um, they've um, yeah they they absolutely loved the film. Um, and then just. Taking a step back, of course, before the film came out, you know, you know, I, I showed various cuts to Bobby and Tata and and yeah, but it's just for safety and security reasons, and you know, we wanted to get their sort of full consent on all that. Wow, and and uh, this film deserves to be seen in much uh, broader audiences around the world, and I suspect you're hoping that that will happen. Yes, we're um we're we're in in the middle of a of, a, of an amazing sort of festival run at the moment uh so we've you know we're in we're in, we're in spain uh this week we won an award in spain we're in lithuania next week uh poland washington um now we we, we had our global uh, premiere at hot docs and we're in new york and and telluride um so we're we're sort of every week there's a festival around the world at the moment yeah. um we we've also just shown on um on pov uh, on pbs in america um, it was a, a Monday night a few uh, a month or so ago. So we had our our, our TV broadcast um, in in America and online streaming on on PBS. Um, and so now we're we're looking to um, you know, to sell our rest of world rights. Congratulations on that! And what a fine film and uh, incredible documentary. And uh, just to conclude, uh, Carl, uh, are you now looking to make another film? Yes, I, I, I'd love to make another film. It's just been the most incredible, amazing process. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been a journalist since I was seventeen, and and to to sort of develop this uh, way of telling stories and and seeing the power uh, 
of it. Um, I, I've loved the creative process. I've, I've loved the complexity of it. I've loved uh, the the impact that that the film has has been able to have, and I'd love to do more of it. Um, I I am working my other job at the moment, so I've got to take. A, I'm going to pause uh, after after this on the film front and you know, try and rest and you know and, and keep going with uh, with work. But uh, I'd love to make another documentary. And I've got well, ideas all yeah. centered around the environment and, and climate change. Oh, excellent, excellent stuff. We've been speaking to Carl Malakunas, the director of Delicado, which is uh, part of the Asia-Pacific Screen Awards and uh, uh, hopefully will be seen elsewhere in Australia. Thanks so much for talking with me, Carl. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.